I hope you all had a good break. Um, welcome back. The next um, item on the menu is a conversation with Mark Graham. Um, it's a great, great pleasure to have Mark here. Uh, he's really one of a kind. Currently, he's the director of the Internet Archives Wayback Machine, where he's responsible for capturing, preserving, and helping people discover and use more than one billion new web captures each week. So they basically archive the web. It's an amazing feed, feed. Previously, uh, Mark held positions at NBC News, iVillage, Rojo Networks, The Well, and at AOL, where he worked on Gopher. Yes, that's Gopher for the dinosaurs and the historians. <laughs> We still remember that thing. And random right fact, Mark also served in the US Air Force in the Pentagon, where he actually acquired many of his early computer skills. Um, and he worked on a US Soviet email service. That's a random fact. Maybe we can come back to that during our conversation. I'd definitely like to learn more about that. Um, but as a, just to kickstart the conversation, Mark, um, you had an illustrious career starting in the very earliest days uh, of the of the web. Can you reflect a bit on the evolution of the web as you've seen it and maybe with a particular focus on the role that Wikipedia has played in your eyes? Sure. Uh, first of all, yeah, it's just really great uh, to be here uh, with, with, with everyone. I, I was looking forward to this conference face to face. I, I've enjoyed uh, many, many of the gatherings that we've had over the years. I uh, met many of you in, in Stockholm la last year. I was looking forward to Bangkok. Um, but you know, this is good. I, uh, these breakout room things, I've done a lot of Zooms, but I haven't actually done the breakout room where you're randomly thrown in with some other people and have conversations. And it's, I just love that because it actually is it's like when we physically come together uh, in that kind of semi-random you know, kind of way that happens when people come together in a physical place. And, and you know, it is also, I think, like, like the net too, uh, in the, at least, the, the net that uh, I don't know I was thinking about and have been working uh, on and toward for a while now. Um, I don't know if illustrious is, is is the right. It's just I've been doing it for a long time. Let's just put it like like that. You know, um, I just say I didn't get into this space because I wanted to do things with the internet per se. I mean, well, first of all, we didn't call it the internet back in the early eighties. What did we you just call called it? it? Getting online. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and uh, but. Um, I, I, uh, I, as you noted, I had spent some time in the Air Force. I, I worked in the, the Pentagon. I'd uh, been, uh, this was the time in the early 80s from 80 to 83 when the Cold War was really at one of its heights and there's a lot of activism um, in the United States and, and indeed all over the world. There was the nuclear weapons freeze movement, for example. Uh, the call to halt the arms race and other kind of efforts like that. So uh, I, when I got out of the military, I moved to Berkeley, California. I was going to get a degree in peace studies. And instead, I decided to start a, a computer network for peace activists. Uh, to, to be honest, the bulletin board systems were, uh, were the rage at that time. Uh, networks like FIDO. Uh, which was a distributed network of PCs, thousands of them all over the world. And I saw many other uh, constituencies developing networks, and I thought to myself, uh, you know, why not the peace movement? There were thousands of peace groups in the U.S. and around the world uh, that could benefit from being in collaboration with each other. I mean, that was one of the, the key ideas. And, um, and so anyway, so myself and a, a bunch of other people got together and that's what we did. It's still running. It's, it's called Association for Progressive Communications, APC.org. Uh, and many of the APC member uh, uh, NGOs around the world are active in the Wikipedia communities as well. So that's, that's uh, very, very gratifying. I'd say, you know, obviously, I don't need to, to, to go through the history of the ebbs and flows of the changes of the web and the internets and all the rest of that for everybody but to say that. And I think, in, and obviously, we're, we're coming back to maybe some of those earlier ideas of openness and collaboration and sharing and community. And for me, at least, Wikipedia uh, and the Wikipedia communities, plural, and the Wikimedia foundations and associations, they embody many of the best characteristics of those uh, early ideals that, uh, that maybe took a while to, to gain hold. And, you know, it's, I think, I, I'm sure many of, of us here in th this meeting have had 
gatherings and conversations and you know virtual dinner conversations over the last few weeks we've been thinking about what what these times of corona are uh have to teach us you know what are the opportunities here and for me at least one of the opportunities is uh, is an amplification of many of the qualities and values and practices uh, that we're engaged with in the Wikipedia community uh, as we help to evolve what we can do together using web-based technologies. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe this crisis can help us refocus on these values that, that the community has. And uh, I guess even the fact that we have this remote conference is really in a Wikipedia spirit where a lot of the a lot of people that collaborate probably never saw each other in, in real life. And uh, this mode of operation is now coming to the world, kind of everyone is becoming a little bit of a Wikipedian that way, I guess. Indeed. I, and I also want to say, just for the start, um, please, for, for me and my work and, and what I really love about physical conferences <laughs> um, is I love talking to people. I, I love, um, you know, what happens when people come together and they just like randomly talk about what they're interested in and, and then new things, for me at least, new things usually come of that. And so I put my email address in there, mark at archive.org. I would, uh, if, if there's one thing that I want to come away from today with, and that is some, some new ideas, um, some new connections, some new um, projects, and new opportunities to collaborate with others, either on this call or, or even people who say, oh, you know, this, this other project here that maybe um, might be of, of, of interest. So I, I encourage and, and invite uh, direct emails and my DMs are open on Twitter. I'm just Mark Graham on, on Twitter. Um, and um, I'm in, a, uh, in full disclosure, I'm not really active on my talk page. So that is one thing. <laughs> So, Mark, after I introduced you, maybe you can introduce all of us to the Internet Archive. What is sure. it that you're going to do? What's the mission? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go kind of quickly on, on this one here. I think um, the Internet Archive is, is a nonprofit. Um, it's about 24 years old, based in San Francisco, mostly, although we're all over the, the, the world. Um, it was started by a guy named Brewster Kale um, with the mission of universal access to all knowledge. Um, Brewster was a, a, an early internet pioneer. He, he developed some of the initial uh, publishing platforms, one called Waze, based on a library standard for those library geeks out there, uh, Z39.50. Uh, he sold that to AOL. Uh, his second company was called Alexa Internet, and he sold that to uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon just before the uh, crash. Uh, it was a pretty good exit. And it gave him the ability to uh, basically pursue a dream that he had had. A, he, he calls himself a techno-utopian. So um, uh, this dream of, of universal access to all knowledge, of, of basically building the Library of Alexandria version 2.0. Uh, you know, could we take all of the works of humankind and make them available to everyone, uh, wherever they are, and um, and to continue that that process in, into the future, and so that's what we've been working on. It's about you know, I'd say before this uh, happened, the, the 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 coronavirus, we had about 150 people. Um, some of them are furloughed now in scanning centers, with, because they physically can't go to their their scanning centers or in libraries all over the world. Those libraries are, are shut down. Um, and um, yeah, so for the last more than 20 years, we've been working to take analog information, make it digital, preserve it, and then make it available to people, and taking born digital information, preserving it, and making it available to people. Um, and I can you know, give an overview. We, we work in a range of media. We think of like media types. So certainly uh, books is a, is a very significant media type for us. Uh, television news is another one. We archive about 60 television news channels 24-7. Uh, radio, we're now archiving more than a thousand radio stations 24-7. Uh, uh, this uh, the music, uh, vast quantities of, of music in a variety of different medium, including 78s. So we've got this fabulous collection of about 180,000 uh, digitized 78s. Uh, journal literature, 
uh, it's an experimental service right now called Fat Cat Wiki, as in like Fat Cat, like big catalog uh, wiki. And uh, I think we have 22 million uh, completely <clears throat> open uh, journal articles there. Uh, and maybe metadata on about 100 million um, others. Uh, I, find this, yeah. Sorry? I find this focus on the, on the analog really uh, fascinating, I have to say, because for, for me, the, the, the web epitomizes the digital. And um, in that par nearly paradoxical, the Internet Archive also has this, uh, this, this huge focus on the analog, which makes a lot of sense, uh, the, the way you put it, because I guess otherwise it'll, it'll be gone. Yeah, well, it'll be gone or wouldn't be accessible to people, right? Um, you know, certainly things like, well, certain media are just have historically been somewhat ephemeral, like television news, right? I mean, you know, unless you were, uh, there, there are some examples. We actually worked with uh, the estate of someone named Miriam Stokes. Uh, there's a movie about her. You could go Google Miriam Stokes, uh, who, who obsessively um, uh, recorded television news on, on tapes, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of hours of this. So th that's an anomaly. Other than that, I say pretty out there, boom, radios like that too. And, and it's not just for historical purpose, but how can you even know what the voices of humanity are right now? Much of the world's population gets their information, what their sense of reality, what's true and important in the world from radio. Uh, and, uh, but unless you're capturing all of it and doing the speech to text translation and then be able to do the full text indexing, how can you do research on that? How can you know the spread of ideas? Uh, how can you know the correlations between the messages that people are getting and maybe, oh, I don't know, certain, you know, uh, public health related, uh, behaviors that they might be expressing, uh, things like, like, like that. Um, I love so, this story. So, uh, uh, yes. sorry, Lots of opportunity for research, right? I've started to kind of want to seed some of those ideas. Yeah. Um, for and, those and, of you out there who are researchers looking for data, we got some data. Um, but I'd be, I'd be remiss to, to I'm sorry? How, how can we get access to that? For example, to the Marilyn Stokes archives? That one's pretty easy, honestly. Um, you know, we, we tend to group things into what we call collections. So uh, it's uh, archive.org slash details slash something. And, uh, and that's something, there's millions of those somethings and some of those millions of those somethings are very large, I mean, billions of things, and some of them are, 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 are smaller. Um, one of the big ones with billions of things in it is the web collection. Um, and the web collection is in, in turn broken down into uh, tens of thousands of other collections, but that's pretty much where we put things um, that we archive from the web via HTTP protocols uh, and then make available through the Wayback Machine. Uh, the Wayback Machine being the, the, the term that we use for this service um, that's been archiving much of the web uh, since 1996. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think when I, when I wrote that, that little introduction, it was a while ago, we're actually archiving more than a billion URLs a day now. Um, at one point, it was, it was a week. It's now more than a billion URLs a day. But I also want to truly underscore, uh, I hope I don't use any superlatives uh, in, in, this, in this share today because words like all, you know, like it's like we scratch the surface. We just, we just you know, do only, only some. And... Um, and we'd like to do more, and we, we try to do what we can um, that we think will be most useful. How do you decide what to collect? I kind of set myself up for that question, didn't I? <laughs> um, well, first of all, it's a work in progress, and I'm always open to suggestions um, from people about how we can do better. And it's not just me, it's, it's, it's a lot of other people. Uh, so the answer is a whole variety of ways. Um, in, in the, so I'm going to speak to, to the web for a little bit because say in, in um, so each medium is a little different. Um, I'll speak to books too. I'll, I'll get to that. But in the case of web, um, there's kind of two, I kind of think of things as two, two worlds. One world is where um, we, we probably can get almost everything um, if we try. Um, and um, so an example of that would be, can we get, can we archive every URL referenced in every Wikipedia article in all Wikipedia sites within a few seconds or a few minutes of that being entered, and then archive all of the links on that particular page? Can we do that? And the answer is, yeah, pretty much. We, we can pretty much do that. It's a couple of million a day. So we do that. Um, another one would be, say, Facebook, right? It's like, 
Can we archive Facebook? And the answer is, gosh, not even a little teeny little bit of it. Um, so there we have to be selective. Um, and, um, and so we use a variety of methods to, um, to uh, listen to signals of the kind of things that we think might be useful to archive. But we, don't, we also don't do it, some of it we do ourselves internally where we, we direct, we come up with these lists. But in many, many, many cases, I mean, three other examples where it's a big collaborative process. One example is we do have a subscription service called Archivet. Uh, and um, and the, the, the users of that service are museums and governments and libraries. Um, and they, they pay us money. We're a nonprofit, but um, that's one of the ways that we bring in revenue is these uh, institutions. They pay us money to do web archiving and they're basically librarians. And then they will define what it is they want to be archiving. So we give them a whole turnkey environment. that They can define the things they, they want to archive. That's called the archivist service. Um, another example would be, and this is especially true over the last um, several weeks is we collaborate with many different research organizations, the Stanford uh, Internet Observatory, uh, Graphica with, with a K for a draft, uh, and, and, a, and a variety of, of others, um, the, uh, the Internet research uh, folks in, in Cambridge. And, and they do studies and, and, um, and they'll, they'll come up with their own list. They're also in, uh, journalists. We're very actively engaged with many journalists. The, the New York Times in particular has been providing us with URLs, um, thousands of URLs that they uh, have been asking us to archive relative to uh, COVID. Uh, and then the third category is everyone who uses the service. Because there's this great feature on the bottom right of web.archive.org called Save Page Now. And anyone can enter a URL into that, uh, into that feature. And they can then even do a checkoff box that says Capture Outlinks and they enter and then we will archive that url and all of the outlinks immediately right now that is uh archiving about 50 million urls a day mm -hmm. um now obviously that's not 50 million times people are entering a single url some of it is scripted uh, plus if you enter one url and it happens to be like a front page of a news site that could easily generate thousands of urls mm -hmm. to archive it seems like an amazing symbiosis between the Wayback Machine and Wikipedia, because Wikipedia is all about documenting. You know, yeah. sources go away, but you want to have them permanently. That's why Wikipedia articles also have a, a permanent uh, ID, and it's, it just seems to fit together so nicely. It does, and so let me, let me shift a little bit to our work more closely with Wik Wikipedia. So about books. Um, we've been digitizing books uh, for a long time, uh, before coronavirus, uh, we were doing about 2,000 books a day. Um, we, we get uh, much of our books now from uh, an organization called Better World Books. Better World Books is a used bookstore, basically, like a big online used bookstore. And one of our nonprofits bought it last year. Um, we, we, wanted more, we wanted more of the books that we wanted, and we were having a hard time getting them. So we bought one of the world's largest used bookstores uh, to, to get it. Uh, it's about a 400 person company. And, um, and then we prioritize the books that we want to get from that bookstore based upon whether they're referenced in Wikipedia articles and whether they're, um, whether they're uh, cited in uh, college and university courses um, and also whether they're popular in certain library lists. So, so Wikipedia is a huge driver for us in terms of identifying the books that we want to, to digitize. Mm -hmm. uh, what, why do we want to do that? Well, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of very specific projects that we've done with Wikipedia over the years. The first one many of you have heard about is where we fix broken links. Mm -hmm. um, fixing broken links is it's kind of you know, re remedial work. Uh, and it's, uh, it's important. Uh, I wish we didn't have to, to do it. I, I actually think it'd be, uh, it would have been better if, the, if when we build things, things can be born archived. Uh, so that you wouldn't have link rot, you wouldn't have the, the risk that a, a given URL could just uh, go away, um, or content drift, uh, maybe even more difficult than link rot. Link rot's when, when, you, when a web page just goes away. Content drift is when that URL resolves, but what, what is there is different than what it was before, where you'd expect it to be the same. Like you wouldn't expect front pages cnn.com to be the same every day, 
but you would expect, say, you know, uh, an article um, to be the same, uh, or at least to be able to know the differences like you can in Wikipedia. So we started working several years ago, as I noted earlier, archiving um, outlinks uh, from Wikipedia and then outlinks from those, those pages. And then we also began working, going through Wikipedia sites, identifying broken links and where we could edit those to correct them, to fix them, to restore them. And I think today we've restored about 14 million um, links on 30 Wikipedia sites. Obviously 30 is not 300. Uh, and a push for me this year is to get that number up so that our software, which is called Internet Archive Bot, uh, is running on all 300 Wikipedia sites. Uh, I, I work with a great team of, of people uh, doing this work, uh, uh, many of them longtime Wikipedians. Maximilian Dorr is one of them, uh, Stephen Ballback, James Hare, uh, very active in the Wikidata um, space, uh, Edward Betts. Who, who used to work, oh my God, this is so weird. I said Edward Betts and his name just zoomed by on my screen. So a message <laughs> came, I, that was strange, it was spooky. Okay, I, and I, Edward used to work for the Internet Archive, but I didn't know he was, he was such a uh, heavy duty Wik Wikipedian, but I met him in Stockholm um, again last year. And so that led to a collaboration that were, and then also um, Jay Horowitz. Uh, and Jake was the, the founder of the Wiki Libraries Project at the Wikimedia Foundation. And so that's the, the team that's mm -hmm. currently uh, working with me on this work. So we started with the fixing of the broken links, but what we've been working on now for almost a year is adding links to citations of books and other things like journal articles on, Wiki, on, on Wikipedia articles, right? And um, so we've... we've uh, We've been working on 10 specific Wikipedia uh, language editions so far. We've added a, more than a quarter of a million links to more than 125,000 books. Um, we got slowed down a little bit because of COVID, um, but you know we're, uh, we're, we're, we're cranking away at it. And I wanna, just wanna show you, I don't have any slides or anything, but I'm just gonna try one little screen share just sure. to show. When, when this, um, so I don't know about the rest of you, but, um, but you know, when this started, I, 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 I got books about uh, viruses. I went to Wikipedia articles and I wanted to watch movies about viruses. Um, uh, so I, I watched uh, Contagion, right? Contagion was a, a 2011 movie. And, um, and then let's see if this works here. I'm gonna do a, a screen share. I'm gonna say screen share and I went to, um, is that working? So share. Okay, good. So that's the uh, uh, Google uh, search and I saw a contagion and it says 2011 film Wikipedia. And I went to it and I was looking around um, and there's an entry. Uh, for a book, uh, and the book is Animal Viruses, Molecular Biology, uh, Hendra, and NIF of Viruses. This is a chapter, actually, in this book, and ISBN number right there. Well, that's really great. I wanted to learn more about um, animal viruses, so I'm going to click on the link, and I'm going to be able to, oh, wait a second. I can't read what's there. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they want me to buy the book, for three hundred nineteen dollars, um, but that's interesting. That's the book I want to see. Bats and viruses. I want to read that chapter. I can't do that. Darn. So anyway, um, that was. Uh, there we go. Okay. So that's an example of what happens when uh, a book is cited in a Wikipedia article that you can't read, mm -hmm. and I want to fix that. Uh, so here's the proposition. Every single book, every single article, uh, every single journal article, uh, every single thing that's referenced in every single Wikipedia article should be a click away. That's the proposition. Why not? Um, and uh, so that's what we're working toward. In this particular case, um, I found a copy of that book and I really wanted to have it ready for today, but it's not ready yet. I bought it for $197. Um, 
uh, from a used bookstore. It wasn't Better World Books. I would have got a discount um, if I had got it from Better World Books. But so I, I, I bought the book, $197 plus shipping. Um, and the best part is the book was deaccessioned from a library. So what does that mean? That means the library threw it out. Basically, right? It was it was thrown. It was deaccession, taken out of a library, taken out of circulation. Some library somewhere, some taxpayer dollar or some, you know, donation. Somebody bought that book at some point, and then it was no longer available. Now I don't know if this book is, you know, the be all and the end all, and it's going to have the answer to the virus. But I think it's it's an example of the value of access to information when and where you want it, and. Um, so, uh, so as soon as we uh, have, as soon as I physically get the book, we're going to digitize it, then I'll link it up. Now, obviously, I don't scale. If I just go around buying all the books that, that are, uh, we want to link, um, it will take me a few centuries. Um, but two things. One, it, what can scale is if we can automate the process through um, our own acquisition process and through partnerships with libraries. Uh, and foundations around the world, and so I'm actively pursuing relationships with foundations and libraries around the world. And also, maybe if we can accelerate um, more of a grassroots, individual, uh, you know, Wikipedia-style barn raising effort to mm -hmm. uh, to to identify and digitize and link uh, primary sources um, to Wikipedia articles. Do you read your books before or after scanning? Do you read them in? <laughs> In paper, on paper, or on screen? I, well, I actually, um, I don't really like reading paper anymore, personally. Um, so the answer is digital, always digital. For me, digital. I, I, buy, I buy the hard copy and I donate. I mean, that's just, once again, that's just like the one-offs. But I'll tell you about another book. And this book, um, this book came out last, it came out today, actually. Um, the book is called Active Measures. And it was written by Thomas Ridd. Um, and it's a, book of, it's a book about the history of disinformation. We're going to make a distinction here between misinformation and dis disinformation is like when it's a deliberate attempt to, to mislead as opposed to just being in error like misinformation. So Active Measures um, came out. I bought, three, th I bought four, four versions of it yesterday. I bought a hardcover version. I bought a Kindle, uh, a, a, a Google Play, and an Apple Books version. I normally don't get so obsessed. But be the reason I did is this book, may be the most highly uh, uh, archived, most, most well archived and cited book ever published. Um, there are use of superlative. Okay, so there are 67 uh, links in the book to uh, Wayback Machine links, and there are 75 uh, links in the book to special collections at archive.org with thousands of pages of primary source documents. Many of these are formally classified government documents from Russian archives, US archives, and other places um, around the world. So 142 links are in the book, uh, which means that they're, they're first of all, you, you can go deeper if you want to, you can go a lot deeper, but also because the links in the book are archive links, they're not gonna go away. Uh, at least there's a, a much, much, much better probability that they'll stick around for a long time than if they weren't archived. Mark, um, I want to make sure that we stay yeah. uh, on, on time and we have, about, uh, we have about 15, 16 minutes left, but I want to open it up also to the, to the audience, get yeah. questions from there. Before we move to that, maybe um, one, um, one last question from my side. Wikipedia is run by volunteers, many of whom we have in the yeah. audience. How important are volunteers for the Internet Archive? Hugely important. I, I'd say, um, you know, I work with many volunteers. I, uh, we, we use Slack pretty extensively, so I invite pe people in, but um, uh, researchers, I mean, you had a researcher on, on your team, Bob, um, that, that did some, some work with us. So I would, I would say we have data, uh, we have applications, we have projects. There's a, there's a storytelling project that I'm trying to um, bring to fruition around using web-based archives to tell stories. Um, there's, uh, you know, so we've, we've got project ideas, we've got data, uh, we've got APIs, and, um, and we've got people who could help also. So I would just in invite anyone who thinks they might want to or be able to contribute in whatever ca capacity um, to please uh, reach out to me at mark at archive.org. Great. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, now over to 
Isaac, who I think has uh, curated some questions. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Bob. Um, first question comes from Zebra and they say, uh, first great strategy for picking which books to dig digitize and all strategies, strategies would have some downside. However, rare books are hard to find by Wikipedians and would then likely be overlooked. Is there an equivalent to archive this link for rare books or other rare media? No, there isn't. And we really don't focus on rare books just because of the physical aspects of them and you know, the expense. We, all the books that we work with, we actually, we own, we purchase them or they're donated to us. But, but having said that, uh, there are other projects that do focus on rare books. And, and that's a great question because that's caused me to think what I could do is partner with some of those projects that have already done the digitization. Uh, I, I know, I know uh, Dan Brown, uh, he paid for a whole lot of books to be archived about uh, feminist uh, spirituality and, and history. Uh, and I'm just thinking to myself, I bet there's an opportunity there to link some of those books to Wikipedia that the, those particular people working on that library maybe hadn't thought of yet. So thank you for that question. Okay. Um, next one comes from Nicholas and they say, how do uh, you deal with Facebook scraping not allowed policy? Um, not allowed. Um, proceed until apprehended. <laughs> you know, we, we, look, we, just, we just do the best that we can. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if that was a technical question or a policy question, but it's, um, yeah, uh, we, we do the best that, that, that we can. Right, the other thing, too, is if, if people are using our Safe Pays Now feature, they're, it's, it's them doing it. I mean, they're, they're initiating, individual people are initiating a, a, um, a, a, a request. Great. Um, next one comes from Omer, and they say, who are the other techno-utopians of the pioneer generation like Brewster, whose projects are still around as nonprofits and not for profit corporations? Well, I mean, in, in the Bay Area, there's Creative Commons, for example, you know, but certainly Wikimedia, I mean, big time public knowledge is, is another one. Um, there's Mozilla, um, you know, found, found Foundation. Um, there are, um, gosh, I don't know, I'm sure there's others that people, the Association for Progressive Communications, APC.org, as I noted earlier, Amnesty International, uh, you know, not necessarily thought of as a tech organization, but certainly more, uh, uh, Access Now, the people who do the, um, the, the, uh, that, the great conference that was gonna be held in Costa Rica, I think this year, that's not, not gonna be, be held, um, but uh, this uh, is called, uh, what's, what's it called? Um, the Internet Rights Conference, um, yeah, there's many, many, uh, for the study of uh, knowledge management education that do OER Commons, open education resource organizations, w uh, Wiki Education found Foundation, many. Great, that's actually really nice to hear. Um, from Andrew, they asked, are there any plans to expose archive resources via API? Absolutely. Uh, if you go to archive.org, I'm done on the bottom, I think there's, the, we list all of our APIs there. If you go to web.archive.org, which is the Wayback Machine on the bottom left, there's this, this a, a link to APIs. Uh, our APIs can always be better, but we've got a great Python library that you can do magic with. Um, and that's one of Brewster's obsession. Our, the, I should say the guy who founded this still runs it. So Brewster typically would be in the office every day. And I was just on Zoom every day. And he's an engineer. He went to MIT and uh, he was a, a software developer first. And so and we're totally into, what, I, I say one of their top five strategic directions is trying to make it easier for other people to use our services, contribute to uh, the services through the APIs. Great, uh, we'll continue with this quick fire. Um, from Husam Adin, they say, have you thought of using tools for automatic semantic annotations to link books with Wikipedia references? Yeah, um, we have, um, and, and um, I think that was, um, I, would, I would love to, could you contact me directly, mark at archive.org? I'd say, you know, we are doing a little bit of, you know, fuzzy logic matching or whatever for books that don't have ISBN numbers, for example. There's a, there's a bunch of challenges with, with books. One challenge is books that don't have ISBN numbers. Um, how do you know which edition of a book someone's referring to? The other thing is, in many cases, the books we're talking about here um, are, these are books that are still being sold, 
right? So we just can't take a book and just make a digital copy of it and say, hey, anyone can have the whole book. That's just not, we just, that's not what we do. Um, and what, what in, in the case of, of linking to these modern books from Wikipedia articles, we, 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 we try to, we link to a, a preview. So two pages of, of the book. And so the trick is how do you get the right two pages? And so, uh, and if, it's, if, if a page number is referenced in the article already, then we try to match that to the, so that page number. There's the physical page number, the logical page number. And so depending upon how the book was scanned and how the, the accurate the metadata is, that can be um, a little tricky. In many of these cases, if people want to go deeper and they want to see the whole book, then they can borrow a digital version of the book with uh, digital rights management uh, for up to two weeks. And so we lend out uh, books equal to the number that we own. If we own three copies of a book, uh, paper, then we will lend out three versions of it in a digital format. We call that controlled digital lending. And you can read about all of that at controlleddigitallending.org. Is that something that um, this controlled digital lending, is that something that came out of your organization or is this a broader movement? It evolved. You know, we had, we had created something, actually Aaron, the, the late Aaron Schwartz um, worked with us and Aaron created an open library back in the day. And it was very similar to Wikipedia. The idea was one, it was based, basically a wiki, uh, one, one page for every book ever published. And that was the idea, metadata about that. Um, and now for about two, 4 million of those pages, I think there's 20 million pages, clearly there are many more books published. Uh, there's the actual book itself is available, uh, at least in a preview fashion, if not a complete borrow fashion, uh, house at archive.org. Very nice. <clears throat> One question that I, uh, that I noted down here earlier was kind of putting together the, the two different angles from of Wikipedia and Internet Archive. In Wikipedia, there's this big debate about inclusionism versus deletionism. So some people want to have Wikipedia articles about everything. There's nothing that does not deserve a Wikipedia article and others are more this uh, curationists. Um, some things are not noteworthy enough to go to Wikipedia. So I'm, I'm wondering how the, is the Internet Archive's attitude more like a hoarder's attitude? We want to get everything or is there stuff that you think is just not worthy of being included? Yeah, I, it's not really, it's not an either or. Um, I think um, certainly our, our staff, our, our team and volunteers that we work with do focus on things um, that, um, that what we focus on certain things that obviously we don't focus on others. So I already mentioned radio, about 1200 radio stations. So we had to pick those 1200 radio stations. Um, and we didn't go for popular music radio stations, right? We went for talk radio. So that's just mm -hmm. kind of at, at that level. Having said that, a, a, uh, just like with Wikipedia, a big part of what makes the Internet Archive um, what, what it is, is the contributions of just anyone who wants to contribute to it. Um, and so there are thousands and thousands of submissions every day of, of text, of audio, of video, uh, old time radio, uh, people that are just, I mean, we had one, I just I mean, we, we come to the end here, but um, in, in uh, late February, uh, no, in late, late March, we, we launched something called the National Emergency Library. So um, the National Emergency Library is where we took about 1.4 million of our digitized books and we lifted the waiting list on them. They're still, they're still uh, available through DRM, but, um, but we, we allowed more copies to be available than we physically owned. Uh, then we did this because almost every library in the world was shut down. And certainly in the United States, mm -hmm. like almost every single library. So all these books, hundreds of millions of books just sitting on shelves. People can't get access yeah. to uh, yeah. them. So we, we, we launched that. And um, yeah, the... Uh, Would it be a great way of keeping people in the libraries employed, giving them yeah. all a scanner and yeah. uh, start scanning A to Z? Yeah, yeah, so... Um, what if, um, what if, uh, for example, let's say in 1999, I created a web page uh, and it has like this really embarrassing photo of myself. Um, and I, it was snapshotted for whatever reason 
by the Internet Archive, is there any way I can get it off? Or yeah, it's, look, Bob, if you, well, I'll, you just write to me and I'll take care of you. But I'll say <laughs> info, info at archive.org. We, we have no interest in embarrassing. Oh, well, if you're a politician, a public figure, and you do things, and then it's public, if it's a public event, then we're not going to, uh, that's, that may be a little different, but generally speaking, right. uh, we're My reasonable. question is actually a serious one, because in Europe, yeah. we have this right to be forgotten, right? So where yeah. there are lawsuits now about people wanting uh, like their pages off Google, for example. And yeah. I'm wondering, have you been? Have yeah, you been yeah, certainly. We, any any re request that's a legitimate request on, under the law of the United States is the Digital Manual Copyright Act um, about things that you own. Um, but also to, under their uh, European right to be forgotten. We, we generally honor those re requests. If we didn't, it would be very hard for us to consider. But I want to go back to the National Emergency Library and say, we noticed some interesting behavior at one point. We wrote a blog about this. So if you go to blog.archive.org, we wrote a blog about this yesterday, talk about kind of obscure things. You know, it's like, well, how do you know you know, one person's used the word hoarding. We tend not to do that, but you know, like, like what, what something one person is interested in may not be of interest. So we noticed that there were thousands of books uh, that were being uh, downloaded from the National Emergency Library, like every hour, and then put back. And people were borrowing them and putting them back, or someone was over and over and over again. And we thought, oh, or someone's abusing the system, right? They're trying to, I don't know, steal whatever. But it turns out it was someone who was interested in Isaac Asimov. And what they wanted to do was they want, they had built a data set of every reference that they can find to Isaac Asimov in every book they can find. And they've got this massive collection of references to Isaac Asimov. Uh, so that was a, that we, we didn't expect that, you know, anyone would have that particular use case um, based upon what we've done. I just want to say things that I'm interested in is, is I'm interested in, in having ensure that everything that people add to every Wikipedia article is archived in real time. And that there is a, a, a born digital, a born archive link available to people. <clears throat> I want to um, make it easier for Wikipedians to write better articles by having easier access to more useful data sources, including books. I mentioned earlier an interest in Easter Island. My personal collection of Easter Island books is pretty extensive. Uh, and only, only a small number of them are currently referenced in the, in the current uh, Wikipedia article about Easter Island. Uh, so I want to make it more. I want to make it easier for editors to get uh, access to the, the reference material that they can use to write uh, better articles. I'm also interested in in how different topics are treated in different languages. And so I spent a fair amount of time about Chernobyl, for example, and collected an, an, an archive or library of books about Chernobyl. So that the Ukrainian and the uh, Belarusian and the English and the Russian, the Japanese articles about Chernobyl at least are able to uh, benefit from um, common uh, data sources. I, I could go on about that, but this is kind of like, like looking forward, moving forward, we'd like to see how archives and libraries can be of greater use to Wikipedia yeah. uh, editors and Wikipedians uh, uh, writ, writ large. Isaac Asimov would have been the perfect uh, segue back to Isaac because I think he has one more question from the audience. Okay. Thank you. One final question. I think ties together what you just said with uh, Dr. Wade's keynote as well. It's from Lodewick. And they say, what are some of the best ways for people to help make the Internet Archive more diverse, thinking in the context of culture, country, gender, and so on? You know, I would say bring yourself to the archive, right? If you, you, are, you are part of that diversity, uh, or if you're part of that diversity. But I think it's, it's not just what we're doing. It's what we're all doing together. And so follow your particular passion uh, and your particular expertise and contribute, contribute, um, you know, those, those books, those materials, those, those audio recordings. Um, I just close with, I, for myself, there was a, a, a children's author that I wrote in, uh, that, that, that I wrote, that I read when I was a little boy. Um, and it was a series of books that written in the 1920s, the 1930s. And uh, um, I, I, I actually went on eBay and I bought all the books. I think there was like 37 of, of the books that this author wrote. Um, it took me a couple of years to get all the books, but I got all the books, 37 of them, digitized all. There's a collection now, uh, the Leo Edwards collection on archive.org. But then I thought to myself, 
you know, that's interesting. I mean, I could do that. I, I could spend, you know, the money to buy a used copy of all of these books that were written so long ago. <clears throat> but why not all the books? You know, why not have an archive and make available every children's book ever written, ever published in every language um, and make all of that available? Um, m m many of them are so old that they're no longer in copyright uh, at all. So that's not even an issue, right? And so there's really no reason. And we have the technology, it's not a lot of money, uh, and it would be of benefit and value to the world. So um, that's a, another example where people can come together and contribute their own particular point of view. Mark, this barrage of superlatives came exactly when my, when my cell phone reminded me that time's up. So I think it's the perfect time to stop. Thank you so much for this conversation. I had a blast and I think it was illuminating for, um, for a lot of the people. Great, uh, great for everyone, for me certainly, to learn so much about the Inner Archive. Um, and I hope you will have a lot of people writing to mark at archive.org. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs>